Hey guys, welcome to Big Life. Um, I've been debating quite a bit on what I'm going to do for my first video, so you haven't seen anything past the introduction. And uh, I've got a lot of plates spinning in the background. I'm putting things together that are going to be on there. But we've got a vacation coming up that I'm going to be taking my family on in a few weeks. And uh, I mentioned earlier that my generator quit in the motorhome. And replacing a generator, making changes to the power system in a motorhome, that can be a really daunting, overwhelming task. I mean, your average RV owner certainly doesn't mind getting their hands dirty, in my experience. But it can be overwhelming to even consider a task that big. So uh, this is going to be such a big project, I'm going to break it into several small parts to walk through each step that I did, how I took, uh, why I chose inverters instead of a conventional direct drive generator, and then how I took portable generators that aren't really set up to be safely operated while mounted in a motorhome because I wanted to be able to operate them in a motorhome. I'm going to walk you through the whole process because it's not that bad when you take it a small step at a time. Uh, so let's get started by discussing why I chose inverter generators instead of a conventional direct drive generator. So it all started when the 20 year old Onan in my motorhome uh, started having trouble when it was running. I only had 400 hours on it, which isn't a whole lot for an Onan. Those are really great generators. Um, but every time the larger of my two air conditioners would cycle its compressor, the generator would just stagger and struggle. And of course, that was causing power problems throughout the motorhome. And this steadily got worse and worse to where uh, the generator was either really hard to start or would start, wouldn't stay running, and then got to where it wouldn't start at all. Um, I got to messing with it, did your basic tune-up type things, plugs, clean the cap and rotor, so forth. And um, then when I was cranking it, I could spray a little ether into the intake. It would crank right up and run on the ether for a few seconds. So uh, I checked fuel pump, had fuel coming to it, um, pulled out the carburetor and started messing up the carburetor. And, you know, I got a really good deal on this motorhome because uh, the previous owners had bought it and never used it. It was just an ornament. And so they sold it real cheap and had low miles, low hours, and everything. Um, and it seems at some point they left it parked for years and then went and cranked up the generator uh, without changing the fuel out of the tank that had been in there for years. And they ran this crummy old fuel through the carburetor. So I took the carburetor off. It was all gummed up and messy. And uh, I cleaned it as best as I could, put it back together, you know, made sure the needle valves were adjusted. And I was still having a hard time getting it to crank. And then when it did crank, it might have only ran for a few seconds. And then um, while I was struggling with it, um, I suddenly heard a crunch and a few bits of one of the bearings came tumbling out of the grill on the bottom of the generator. It was either a main bearing on the engine or a bearing on the, uh, on the generator section. But at that point I decided this poor thing was just toast. So uh, that's why I started investigating replacements. And um, I knew I was having power problems and I've seen the damage that a direct drive conventional generator can do to sensitive electronics. Um, I have a couple of portable generators that I used around my house while the power was out for a few days and we were getting our, uh, our circuit breaker panel replaced. And one of those things managed to kill a UPS that uh, I was using to power my server rack. And then the other one, it ran my refrigerator just fine, but then some of the electronics on the refrigerator don't work anymore. Like um, I don't get my reminder to replace the filter, it doesn't work anymore. So sensitive electronics and conventional direct drive generators just don't get along well. Modern equipment needs cleaner and better power than a direct drive generator can operate. Now, my thinking initially was that I was going to get a couple of battery inverters or, you know, one big one, whatever I needed to do that I could stack in parallel. And then I was just going to get a little uh, small engine and a car alternator and connect those together, direct drive with a belt, something like that in the generator compartment and run the output from that alternator to these inverters. But it turns out just assembling it myself like that introduced a lot of moving parts or asking to fail and uh, just some major inherent inefficiencies in the system. And so when I started doing a little homework, I discovered that um, there are companies who are manufacturing these inverter generators and they've been doing it long enough that they've become mature and a lot of these inherent problems have been engineered out. So these already assembled inverter generators are a great idea. And besides that, you can buy one for a lot less than you can piece it together like I was thinking about doing. So there's lots of discussion 
uh, on YouTube. Lots of great videos being made where people are unboxing, demonstrating, testing uh, both direct drive and inverter generators. Um, and there's really good content there. It's really worth watching and checking out and seeing people's experiences with them. Um, but there's not much explanation as far as the fundamentals of how an inverter generator works and how it's different than a direct drive or conventional generator. Um, and that's kind of important to understand, to understand the benefits of it. There's some very, very, you know, um, skin deep explanations of the differences. Uh, but I'm going to kind of try to clarify this some. Um, at its core, the purpose of a generator is to take the chemical energy contained in fuel, be that propane, natural gas, diesel fuel, gasoline, whatever. They take this chemical energy, uh, take it through whatever steps necessary, and convert that to electrical energy, which you in turn use to drive your appliances, electronics, etc. Um, the steps that it does that by um, are, at its core, again, real simple. Uh, direct drive generator especially is very simple. Um, you're taking the chemical energy of the fuel, and there is a uh, engine that converts that chemical energy into uh, linear kinetic energy uh, in the movement of the pistons and the cylinders and then those are going to a crankshaft which converts that into rotational energy that rotational energy is turning um, a magnet or set of magnets called a stator inside or around a set of stationary magnets and as those magnets move within one another's magnetic fields, the relative motion between them uh, generates electricity, uh, movement of electrons, and because it's rotational and constantly changing, the direction of the electron flow is constantly changing, so you get alternating current output. So by carefully regulating uh, the size of those magnets and the speed of the engine, you can get the expected uh, 120 volts at 60 hertz, which is you get, which is what everyone in North America expects and uses. Uh, but gasoline engines aren't that predictable. Um, sometimes, you know, as the load goes up, the engine's going to bog down. That can cause voltage to drop, and that can also change the frequency. Uh, and that's not good for sensitive electronics. That's not good for certain types of motors and and heating appliances. Um, so they can get the job done. They can get the job done with a lot of simpler devices like lights um, and, and maybe something like a small fan. Um, but more sensitive stuff doesn't respond well to that. Um, so the answer to that is the inverter generator, which is basically combining uh, an inverter with a direct drive generator. An inverter is a device that you see a lot of, especially in this new green era that we live in. People are using inverters to power their houses when they're running on solar. Uh, inverters are used in electric cars to, uh, to drive the, uh, the motors, things like that. Um, an inverter takes direct current, which is uh, electricity where the electrons are not continuously changing direction. They are consistently moving in one direction. Um, and it converts that to the alternating current. Um, and and at its simplest level, cheaper inverters, older inverters, uh, they use a very simple process of simply turning some diodes on and off. And by doing that, they can force the, the current to change direction uh, at a regular inter interval, uh, but then that produces uh, a square wave. And that is true alternating current, but that's not what your devices are expecting. They're expecting a sine wave. And that square wave can cause some real problems. Anybody who's tried to use um, an older UPS, because those use an inverter, um, or tried to use a cheaper or older inverter to run, say, a ceiling fan or a switch gear, you'll notice it hummed and it got really hot while it was running on that square wave. Uh, the same thing happens with some cheaper inverters that they say, they call it a modified sine wave. Uh, they're basically... Uh, instead of generating a sine wave or a square wave, they are generating steps where it staggers its way up and back down uh, to create alternating current. And again, that's not very good for motors and so forth. Um, now, I can't go into great depth on how a true sine wave is created, uh, but it's done using MOSFETs and comparators to consistently monitor, adjust, and average what's coming from the MOSFETs so you can get a really nice, clean, pure sine wave coming out of it. And the great thing about a well-engineered inverter 
is that um, its power demand on the current coming in uh, can go down dramatically based on whatever it's trying to drive. So when the power demand is low on the inverter, the power input to the inverter can be low. And that's what makes inverter generators very efficient. They can uh, reduce their engine RPM to lower the amount of electricity being generated uh, going into the inverter section and still be able to produce really good, clean, consistent voltage and consistent frequency, which is what's really safe for sensitive electronics like TVs and laptops and things like that. Because uh, anybody who's used a, a cheap inverter or a, a conventional generator on their sensitive electronics, like say your laptop, um, it works. Of course it works. Uh, but you may notice that your power power cord, power supply, charger, whatever it was, uh, died a premature death. Um, and that's why, because of that really poor uh, condition power that's coming in. This can also cause premature death on things like the TVs in your motor home. You know, modern flat screen TVs, they're quite, quite a bit more sensitive to poor power conditions than the older CRT TVs that RVs came with 20 and so forth years ago. Uh, but how does... But that kind of leaves a gap in my explanation here. Okay, we know that the direct drive generator is producing alternating current, messy as it may be, depending on how well the engine's running. And we know that the inverter is taking direct current and producing alternating current. So what happens in between them there? Well, they have uh, what you're probably familiar with if you're a gearhead as an alternator. And there's a, uh, a common misconception that alternators produce direct current. They don't. Um, again, the alternator is taking rotational energy from the engine and converting that into electrical energy using uh, fields of magnets. And the way an alternator in a car works is that it's producing 12 volts alternating current, which obviously doesn't drive all the electronics and so forth in your car. It expects direct current. So what they've done is they've created three separate fields inside of that alternator. Each of them uh, producing 12 volts alternating current that are 120 degrees out of phase with each other. And then they use diodes to cut off uh, the bottom half of that sine wave, of each sine wave. And then by overlapping them at 120 degrees out of phase, you get this kind of crude, ripply 12 volts direct current. Um, and that is suitable for your automotive applications. Um, that's why the power in cars a lot of time is very noisy, uh, you know, and that, that's been an issue in the car stereo business for a long time, uh, trying to keep that kind of alternator whine and noise out of your speakers. Uh, so what's beautiful about these integrated pre-built uh, inverter generators, like I said, is that they can, um, in their alternator section, they use more than three phases they might use six phases that are 60 degrees out of phase, which cuts back the ripple a considerable amount, makes it a smoother direct current. And then they can add pi type filters and things like that to reduce the ripple even further. And they're also not limited to 12 volts DC. Uh, they can be working at 24, 36, 50 volts, whatever they decide to engineer it to. And by having that higher voltage output from the alternator section, then they're gonna have less power demand between the alternator section and the inverter. Less for smaller wires, safer operation, and things like that. Then it goes into that inverter section, which in turn is going to use, like I said, I, I can't, it would take an hour to really explain a lot of it, but you know, by using MOSFETs, comparators, and pulse width modulators, and so forth, it's able to average and create a nice smooth uh, sine wave. And this gives you really, really clean, beautiful power. The other thing that's really great about inverter generators um, that conventional generators, direct drive generators can't do, is that inverters can be stacked. Um, well-built, well-engineered, just plain inverters that aren't an inverter generator can be stacked if you need extra power. So you can take two 1500 watt inverters, connect them in parallel, and you've got a 3000 watt capacity. The same thing is true for inverter generators. Um, unless you've got a really crummy one, they can be connected in parallel and have their power capacities combined. Uh, sometimes you can even mix and match sizes, although you've got to watch what the manufacturer recommends in that case. Sometimes you can combine a 3000 watt and a 2000 watt, things like that. So once I decided 
that um, there were just too many inherent inefficiencies and potential problems in building my own inverter generator. I started researching uh, inverter generators online and I immediately stumbled into ones by Briggs and & Stratton and Honda. And those are two highly respected names, which means that the inverter generators built by them are very expensive. Um, just the nature of the fact that there's more parts, more engineering involved and so forth, that um, inverter generators are going to be more expensive than a conventional generator. Um, but these things were insanely expensive, so I was a little bit frustrated and put out. I not only couldn't find one that was big enough uh, to drive my motorhome, everything in my motorhome, including both of my air conditioners, um, but even the ones that were too small were just crazy expensive. Uh, however, it doesn't take much searching before you stumble across uh, this Predator unit that is uh, frequently compared to the 3000 watt Honda unit. Um, and it is very comparable to uh, the, the well-loved Honda 3000 watt inverter generator. Um, and as it turns out, this Predator generator is great. It is really great. The reviews everywhere for it are excellent. Performance tests on it have been stellar. People use them for thousands of hours, but nothing more than routine maintenance. Um, and then a little bit more digging reveals that Predator, uh, which is a Harbor Freight brand, uh, doesn't even actually make this generator. They're buying it from some factory in China and putting their name on it. And they're not the only ones. Uh, Northern Tool still sells the exact same generator uh, in a blue case with the name Power Horse on it. And uh, then if you go looking a little bit more, you'll find that Bearcat sells, again, the exact same generator with an orange case and the Bearcat label on it. Bearcat is actually a respected brand compared to Power Horse and Predator, so they want several hundred dollars more for it. It's the exact same unit. And I've also stumbled across uh, this Generac model that looks to me like it is also the exact same generator. Now, I'm not certain about this one because it doesn't have the wheels and the case is a little bit different but it sure looks like the same unit to me and if Generac is willing to sell this generator with their name on it that's quite an endorsement um, so I had myself sold on uh, buying two of these and um, and connecting them in parallel to drive my motorhome then it would have been real simple to say for example get the power horse one and get the Harbor Freight one and put them side by side in my generator basement and then I would always be able to keep them straight in regards to discussing and controlling them, the red one and the blue one, etc. Um, however, uh, just recently um, I stumbled across this inverter generator here that is on the Northern Tool website. Um, as of right now, it's only available as an online order, but this price is spectacular. Uh, its power ratings are very, very high. I mean, they're higher even than the uh, than the Predator, Power Horse, etc. unit. Um, it's a little. It's the problem is that it's unproven. It doesn't have all this backing by the hundreds of people who bought them, used them, and loved them for uh, for all these years. It's it's an open frame. It's not enclosed in a case. Um, it doesn't have the wheels, and it's missing the gauges, and it, it doesn't even have binding posts for connecting in parallel. Uh, although they do list it as being parallel capable. Uh, but at this price, I mean, I can buy two of these for only a little bit more than I would have bought one of these other ones. And I'm still getting really, really uh, good high uh, power capacity to run my air conditioners and safely operate all the electronics in my motorhome. Um, now, considering that this is a portable generator, it's not meant for a motorhome, uh, there's a lot of... Uh, elements of the design inherent that are not safe for a motorhome that we have to work around if we're actually going to put these in the motorhome basement instead of just carry them. Uh, you know, lots of people who, especially people with pool campers, you can just carry your generator with you and then once you park, go get the generator out, set it on the ground next to the camper, plug it in and fire it up. And it works most of the time. You run into some earth ground versus floating ground issues that are not too hard to work around in those cases. Uh, but I didn't want that. I wanted to be able to power up the generators uh, while we're going down the highway. The reason we have a motorhome is so that people can go lay down and stretch their legs while we're going down the highway on a long trip or have use of the bathroom without pulling over. And you don't have that with a pull camper. Um, so I didn't want to have to pull over and go out 
outside to start the generator and obviously you can't set the generator on the ground while you're going down the highway um, and you know if the weather is bad if it's really really hot or something and uh, you don't want to have to go out in the weather to start the generator uh, so I want to be able to control it from inside so obviously electric start is is a valuable uh, valuable feature so I have ordered two of these and they're going to be delivered to uh, a northern tool store not too far from me um, and in the next video you're going to see me uh, get these unboxed and break, broken in so I'll uh, show a little bit on how to safely break in a generator and make sure that uh, everything is working like it's expected then in subsequent videos I'm going to explain how we're going to get these mounted in my motorhome and then how we're going to connect them into the existing uh, wiring safely how they can operate safely while they're in the motorhome what my you know, modifications we need to make how we can set up an umbilical from the generators to the inside of the motorhome so that they can monitor it and operate it from inside the camper while they're having to go dig in the basement and um, at the same time these things have enough power capacity combined that um, I don't need my motorhome to have 30 amp service anymore uh, my motorhome has 30 amp service which I initially liked because you do run into campgrounds that don't have 50 amp service uh, but those have gotten pretty rare and on 30 amp service I can only run one of my air conditioners uh, I suppose they both could safely run on 30 amp service but you're kind of pushing the limits of 30 amp service that way and my motorhome has been wired so that will only allow one air conditioner to run when you're on the 30 amp service so what I'm also going to be doing is upgrading my motorhome to 50 amp service and I'm going to walk through the steps of that. And like I said, every one of these, this whole project is going to be very large and overwhelming. But I'm going to take it in small steps. And I'm going to explain them how they're, how they're done because they're not that difficult. They're not that complicated. And anybody who wants to put their mind to it can do this. Can replace a generator. You don't have to buy these really expensive Onan generators that are conventional direct drive generators that aren't even that good for your electronics. You can get a couple of good... Um, portable inverter generators and use these in your motorhome. Uh, you get extra efficiency, it's going to be fuel efficiency I mean, it's going to be safer for your electronics and also by having two of these wired in parallel um, when you don't need the full capacity of both generators you can just start one of them and just run one generator to run the stuff in your camper and then if your power demands start to get higher you can start the other one and of course that's going to save you a lot of fuel and reduce hours on the generator and things like that and uh, as I said there's there's safety concerns when you're using a portable generator mounted in your motorhome or your camper and we're going to discuss how to address those safety, safety concerns and make sure that it's going to work in a manner that's not going to be a danger to you your family your camper other people you know property damage and and risk of health and risk of life that's definitely not a worthwhile trade-off so we're going to make sure all those things are completely mitigated as much as possible uh, to the point where they're probably less likely than they were in the previous configuration so i hope you learned a little something today um, again this is going to be a long project with a lot of steps to it i don't think it's anything that anyone who can handle a turning a screwdriver and turning a wrench uh, should be able to handle this um, be looking for another video for the unboxing and break-in of the new generators um, within I hope a week or two whenever they arrive at the store because they wouldn't give me a good window on my arrival date um, in the meantime I'm little Jay and life is a gift so make it big